Jory's father uh, is Swedish and her mother is Norwegian. Uh, Norwegians and Swedish have always immigrated and tended to locate in the same places in our country and so they have a lot of jokes uh, between them and uh, one I remember is uh, two Swedes and two Norwegians were driving uh, in a pickup truck around Lake Michigan and the two Swedes were up front in the cab and the two Norwegians were in the back in the open uh, uh, back and um, uh, the two dumb Swedes drove off the road into the lake. The coroner's report reported that the two Swedes made it out of the cab to safety, but the Norwegians drowned. Apparently they had trouble getting the tailgate down. <clears throat> <laughs> yep. The Apostle Paul was in a prison in Rome in 62 AD, writing to a church in Philippi. If I were writing to you from a dark, damp prison cell chained to a Roman guard at all times, I would be asking you to pray for my release. Please contact Senator Wyden and Merkley to see if they could obtain uh, my release. Um, I'd be depressed, but not the Apostle Paul. Uh, he's not depressed. He speaks about joy 19 times in this letter. He's filled with praise and laughter. What's the secret of his joy? How does he maintain his happiness while he's confined in prison? These are the questions we're asking in this series, Fixer Upper. Between 2013 and 2018, Chip and Joanna Gaines filmed 179 episodes of Fixer Upper. They fixed houses. We're talking about fixing the way we think so that we can know true happiness. Everybody wants to be happy, but many people are not happy. The first question in the Presbyterian Church's Shorter Catechism asks, read this with me. What is the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. We're to glorify God and enjoy him. We don't bring glory to God by being depressed and down in the mouth all the time and negative. We bring joy to God by uh, enjoying the, the life he's given us and the beautiful world he's given us to live in. One reason uh, pursuing happiness is important because our witness for Christ hangs in the balance. If people know you're a follower of Christ, but you're always negative and complaining and, and whining, how do you think that attracts them to Christ? They say, if, if that's what following Christ leads to, no thanks, I'll pass. So one reason pursuing happiness is important is because it's critical to causing other people to be interested in Christ. When they see that following Christ has changed your life and brought you happiness, it makes them more interested. If you can show that you found happiness in Jesus, it makes them curious about Christ. How can we find true happiness? Uh, this is the question we're asking in this series. We discover the answer by looking to the Apostle Paul and his letter to the Philippians. If you want to open to uh, our passage today using our Bibles, <coughs> it's on page 1178. As I already said, as we open the book, we find Paul in a jail cell in Rome. He's no longer free uh, to plant churches, um, but he's not depressed in his situation. He rejoices in his circumstances. How does he do it? It all has to do with his mind. The Holy Spirit has renewed his mind so that he can think differently about his circumstances. Paul chooses to look for the positive things that God can use through his prison uh, uh, sentence. Paul maintains his happiness in prison because he looks at his, his situation through the perspective of what God is doing. If you want to be happy, look for what God is doing through your circumstances. To all of you, especially the women we honor today, if you want to be happy, 
Look for what God is doing through your circumstances. I find three ways we can maintain our happiness no matter what situation we're facing by looking at what God is doing through our circumstances. First, look for the good God can do through your situation. The Apostle Paul found positive things that were happening as, as a result of him being in prison. He had new opportunities uh, to share Christ. Read this uh, with me. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Rather than griping about being in prison, Paul saw it as an opportunity to share Christ with new people. Uh, 24 hours a day, Paul is chained to a Roman guard. They served six-hour shifts, so he had four different uh, guards to talk to every day. It gave him plenty of time to query their spiritual condition. Uh, he realized that being in prison, he had an opportunity to share with people he didn't have the opportunity to share with before. Paul's chains also gave him, gave him contact with officials in Caesar's court. He was in Rome as an official prisoner. Uh, Rome was investigating this new Christian sect. Was it a, just a kind of a, a, another part of a Jewish sect? Or was it something entirely new? And so they sent all kinds of legal scholars in to interview Paul. Paul saw this as an opportunity to explain the Christian faith to many people that otherwise would have had no interest in looking into it. At the end of Philippians, we read, all the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Through Paul's influence, some members of Caesar's household became Christians. Paul does not bemoan his situation in prison. Rather, he discovered that his circumstances opened up new opportunities to share with other people. When Jory and I returned from Romania with our daughter, Andrea, um, we uh, began to get all kinds of phone calls on how do you do a, an adoption overseas. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, the United States uh, averaged 1.6 million abortions every year. Thankfully, uh, last year, uh, the number's down to 638,000. But when there's that many abortions occurring, parents that want to adopt have to look overseas. And so Jory estimated she was getting 25 calls a week asking, how do you do that? And she said, I just, I'm overwhelmed. And so she would just kind of erase many of the voicemails. She said, I can't return all these calls. We saw all these people wanting to get information from us. We were one of the first families in the United States to adopt from Romania. And uh, uh, we saw them as, uh, the calls as, you know, intruding on our lives, uh, in irritation. But one day we, we sat down and we were talking about it. And I said, wait a minute, I'm a pastor. We've given our lives to minister to people and to share Christ with people. And people are knocking on our doors and we're irritated. So it was at that point, we had just kind of a change in our thinking and Jory started Kidspire. Over the years, she's been able to share the gospel with probably 2,500 people going through her adoption classes. She always shares the gospel with them, and she's uh, been able to help 1,000 families adopt. It all started with a change in her mind of her circumstances, looking at it not as a problem, but as an opportunity. When Jory walks around with our three Vietnamese uh, daughters, uh, whether she's, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of like a walking advertisement for Vietnamese adoption. Jory sees people when they, when they see them, they look at their, the girl's dark, silky hair and almond eyes, and they look at Jory and see her blonde hair and brown eyes, and they're trying to figure it out. They're wondering if the father is Vietnamese. He isn't. <laughs> That's more what he looked like. It must have been scary when, when, uh, Jory placed our girls in my arms for the first time. So Jory just did a change in her thinking. 
to not see all the people asking her questions as a problem, but as an opportunity to share Christ. Do you have an overwhelming situation? What's your prison? Maybe some bad things have happened to you. You're wondering what good can come out of your situation. Change the way you look at your situation. Ask what God wants to do through your circumstance to spread the news about Christ and to bring honor to him. God did another good thing through Paul's imprisonment. Other believers stepped forward to share the gospel. Read this with me. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters in the Lord have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Because of Paul's example of being willing to share Christ and even go to prison for it, other believers drew new confidence that they could do the same thing. Because the Christian faith was being investigated by the Roman government, uh, lots of people were talking about the Christian faith, and, it, and Christians decided this is a great opportunity to share about Christ. And while Paul was in prison, other believers stepped forward to make up what he was no longer doing. They could plant churches. They could help shepherd the churches he had planted. Paul rejoiced that the gospel was spreading rapidly while he was in prison. He says, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. So he says, well, some are sharing Christ because, you know, they're jealous of him. He had planted all these churches. His churches were bigger. He had led more people to Christ. They saw this as an opportunity to, to catch up and maybe surpass him. But others, out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. This is two of the times he mentions rejoice or joy in his letter. Whatever their motivations for sharing Christ, Paul says it doesn't matter. The important things is that Christ is being shared. It's easy for us to be critical of other churches, other ministries that do things differently than we do. I try to never criticize another ministry. All that matters is if they love Christ and are sharing Christ. I mean, the little things like how they baptize, how they do communion, how they organize their churches, they don't matter. Maybe you're a mother who feels chained to your home by your young children. God can use you to bring salvation to your kids. Susanna Wesley had 19 children. And this is before, you know, labor saving devices like we have today. Two of her sons were John and Charles Wesley. Their ministry shook the British Isles. John Wesley and George Whitfield were the two most uh, well-known evangelists uh, in the 18th century. They disagreed on doctrinal matters. Both were successful. Thousands of people came to Christ through their preaching. It's reported that one person asked Wesley at one point, do you expect to see Whitfield in heaven? He says, no, I don't. Person says, are you saying you don't think Whitfield's a converted man? Wesley says, no, I'm not saying anything such thing. Of course he's a converted man. I'm saying he'll be so close to Christ at the throne and I'll be so far away, I'll never get to see him. The important thing was that he was sharing Christ and he rejoiced in that. If you want to be happy, look for what God is doing through your circumstances. Second, pray and depend on the Holy Spirit. Read this with me. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. 
Uh, rather than despairing about his imprisonment, he rejoices that it gives him new opportunities because he knew that the Philippians were praying for him and he knew the power of prayer. We can maintain happiness in the midst of difficult things if we pray. Are you aware how powerful prayer is? A couple of weeks ago, Jamie went out to take a uh, test at Portland State on, on anatomy. And before she went out, she asked Dory and me to pray for her taking the test. It's very smart to ask people to pray for you. Do you, do you ask your family members? Do you ask your community group members to pray for you? Do you ask friends? I mean, do you turn in prayer requests on Sunday morning? We put a spot at the bottom of a, the communication card. Some of you do it regularly. Others of you do not. It's a great opportunity. You could come Wednesday and pray with us. We pray from 10 to 1115. I share some requests and we pray for all the prayer requests. Look again at what Paul says. Read this with me. For I know that through your prayers... And God's provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. Paul rejoiced in his imprisonment because he knew the power of prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver him from prison and to help him to not wallow in self-pity and bitterness. On Easter Sunday, we were stunned by the terrorist attack in Sri Lanka on churches and hotels. We've heard a bit about religious persecution uh, in recent years, but way underreported has been the uptick of persecution of Christians. The Christians have been killed for their faith or driven from their homes or their churches have been destroyed. We ask, why does God allow things like happened in Sri Lanka? I don't know, but I know God always works good out of bad things. Uh, when the man uh, killed uh, 32 people at Virginia Tech, April 16th, 2007, in the midst of that incredible pain, the hope and love of Christ was proclaimed at 30 of those funerals. Faced with the suddenness of death and the reality that we don't know how long we're going to live, Many people in the Virginia Tech community committed their lives to Christ. On June 4th, 1989, the world watched in horror as innocent people were killed in Tiananmen Square. What possible good could come out of this destruction of innocent civilian life? Well, experts say Tiananmen Square was a spark that has led to hundreds of thousands of Chinese becoming Christians. Before June 4th, many people, many students, saw the Communist Party as their hope for a better future and a better income. On that day, all those hopes vanished. We estimate that students were becoming Christians at the rate of a, a dorm a day looking for answers, many of them began to flock to the underground church. When you face difficult times, take your eyes off of the circumstances and focus on what God is doing, the power of the Holy Spirit in prayer. If you want to be happy, look for what God is doing through your circumstances. Third, keep the ultimate purpose of life to know and serve Christ firmly in your mind. Paul understood that his purpose was to lead as many people as possible to Christ. Read this with me. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul wasn't afraid to die. He knew if he died, he would go to be with Christ in heaven. But if he lived, he would have opportunity to lead more people to Christ and shepherd the churches he had planted. Live or die was a win. Paul's sole purpose was to know and serve Christ. For to me to live, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
What's your purpose for living? For to me, to live is blank and to die is blank. How would you fill in those blanks? For to me, to live is money. And to die is awful because I'd leave it all behind. For me, to live is fame. To die would be terrible because I'd be forgotten. For me, to live is power. To die would be horrible because I'd lose all that power. For what are you living? No matter what circumstances he faces, Paul remains joyful. How does he do it? It all has to do with his mind. He keeps his mind focused on the truth that he can serve Christ in any situation. If you want to be happy, you have to learn to think right. Dr. Paul Young Cho is the pastor of the largest church in the world in Seoul, Korea. Uh, there are 830,000 members. And in his book, The Fourth Dimension, he tells of a conversation he had with a, a leading neurologist in Seoul. He says, Paul, do you realize that our latest studies on the brain have found that the center of speech rules over all the other centers? The speech center rules over all the other nerves. So if you speak something, let's say, you know, the, my body is weak. Well, then all the parts of the body hear this message. They say, well, the speech center is, has told us that we're to become weak. So it matters the way we think. Do you want to understand how powerful the mind is? If you're unhappy, could it be that you're thinking the wrong way about things? About your circumstances? If you want to know joy, focus on Christ and the good things he can do no matter what situation you're facing. If you want to be happy, look for what God is doing through your circumstances. Rachel, come on up here. This is Rachel Nichols. Rachel is the mother of three. And uh, if you were here last week, I had Matt come up here. I thought Matt had a good attitude in facing a, a possible layoff from Forest Grove. And uh, I'm impressed with your children, and so you must be doing a great job as a mom. Tell us a little bit about how mom's going. All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and happy Mother's Day to the moms. <clears throat> um, so on this day, about 14, not about, on this day exactly, 14 years ago, I became a mother when my daughter Brooklyn was born. As I held Brooklyn in my arms, I was in disbelief that she was really mine. It took my breath away, and an overwhelming feeling of love completely consumed me. We spent the next two days in the hospitals with nurses checking in and throughout the day and evening. My confidence slowly began to grow and started to feel, maybe I could do this mom thing. And that's when they told me it was time to go home. No tests, surveys, questionnaires, or anything to certify that I was going to be a good mom when I got home. The nurses got a good laugh as I shared my concerns with them on my way out. A few weeks. Of sleepless nights, we started to develop a routine and I began to feel confident. It was a few months after Brooklyn was born that we learned we were expecting our second child. Matt and I had discussed having children somewhat close in age, but that was only talk, so it was quite a surprise when we learned we were expecting again. It was 11 months and one day after Brooklyn arrived, we were joined by Matthew. While some people took pity on us and looked at us in disbelief, we looked at ourselves as being pretty efficient because our family was now complete. We started making plans and looking at that September 2024 date when both kids would be out of the house. God, however, had different plans. It was Easter morning in 2011 that we learned our family of four would grow to a family of five that December when Ashlyn arrived. There have been some great mom moments through the years and some not so great mom moments. There have been some challenges that seem to make each day go on forever, and at the same time, 14 years seems to have gone in a blink of an eye. My kids will tell you that I'm a bit quirky, I wear my heart on my sleeve, I speak my mind, and I sometimes possess a mom voice so loud at times the whole neighborhood knows when it's time to brush your teeth and go to bed. <laughs> I will be the first to admit that I am not a perfect mom. I have closed car doors on tiny hands. I've tried to close the trunk of a car just as Matthew stuck his head in to see if I'd taken out all the groceries. My culinary skills are still in the development stage. 
I have yet to fully grasp all the ins and outs of the various kids' sports. For example, Ashton was preparing to run in a track meet when she was four years old. I was standing with her and trying to give her a good pep talk before her race while Matt was at the finish line waiting with the camera. We were waiting for the group in front of us to run their race when the starter pistol, pistol fired. I looked down to give Ashlyn a few last words of encouragement, but it was too late. She had already begun running in the boys' heat. <laughs> the other parents gave me that wonderful stare that only parents do, only to be topped by the glares I got when Ashlyn crossed the finish line first and proudly accepted that first place ribbon. <laughs> There have been less humorous challenges that I have faced as a mom, and many lessons I have learned along the way. I have struggled with my self-confidence and feeling inadequate, struggled with stress and anxiety. It has not always been pretty and not something I'm always proud of, but each one of these struggles has given me an opportunity to grow. My kids can look at their mom and see someone who did not give up and did not back down. They see a mom who went back to school and completed her degree. My kids see a mom who has remained strong in her faith through both the sunny and the rainy days. My kids are a daily reminder of what unconditional love is, the same love God has for us. Of course, some days are the ones they're demonstrating the unconditional love, like when they tell me dinner tastes delicious. There are many distractions in our lives that can take our focus off God and his purpose for our lives, and I pray that every day I can remain focused on my ultimate purpose and be an example to my children of how great God is, so when they start families of their own, they too focus on serving God and putting Christ first. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. <clears throat> Well, uh, Rachel is a mom who illustrates the point I'm talking about today. Why don't you read this with me? If you want to be happy, look for what God is doing through your circumstances. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Apostle Paul. What a great example he was in prison. Couldn't move around, but he wasn't depressed. He wasn't angry. He talked about his joy 19 times in this letter, and he expressed it, and we want to be the same. Our circumstances don't have to put us down, and uh, we can have joy and true happiness in the midst of difficult times if we keep the focus on what you're doing through our circumstances. So help us to do that. Would you like to tell God that right now? I'd like to give you everybody here an opportunity to say something to God before we go. Uh, tell him you want to be happy. Maybe admit to him that certain things that are going on in your life have really got you discouraged and depressed and sad uh, and say, you know, I want to learn to know your joy in the midst of that. If you've never given your life to Christ, that'd be the way to start. Invite Christ into your life and say, Christ, I believe you're the son of God. You were raised from the dead. I want you to become, come into my life. You pray. Everybody pray right now. Lord God, we want to be happy. We confess that we're probably unhappy more than we want to be and happy less than we desire to be as well. Forgive us. Help us to enjoy the life you gave us and look at what you're doing through our circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.